Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Hannah Kuhnert, and I use she, her pronouns. Uh, and I'm here today um, as a member of the Circle for Reconciliation and Justice from the Eastern Synod. I'm also here as a young Canadian Lutheran, um, and I'm thrilled to be back at another Bible study. So thanks everyone for joining us, and I'm looking forward to a great couple of weeks here as um, we continue on in um, our little series here. So I'd also like to start out just by saying a quick thanks to my mom. If you didn't grasp from the same last name, Karen Kudert is my mother. Um, and I'd just like to say thanks to her for putting all this together. I think it's pretty cool. Um, having said that, my mom and I are speaking to you from Waterloo, Ontario, which resides within the Haldeman Tract, which is six miles on either side of the Grand River, uh, belonging to the Mohawk, the Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Seneca, and Tuscarora peoples of the Six Nations. Uh, this land is also part of the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Chinantan people. And as people of God and settlers in the Great Lakes region and of Northeastern North America, um, it is both our call and our responsibility to live into the Dish with One Spoon Treaty established in these lands, uh, to share the resources uh, and the gifts um, of this territory in these regions to the mutual benefit of all who inhabit it. Building relationships with our indigenous neighbors and living out this principle is something we all as Canadians and Christ followers should be striving for in this country. Um, and so there's just a little bit of knowledge about where we're coming from uh, from today. So speaking of this country at large, um, I do have the pleasure of welcoming you to the first Bible study uh, of our series as we celebrate the 80th anniversary of the Canadian Council of Churches. The Canadian Council of Churches represents 85% of Christians in Canada and over uh, 13,000 congregations from coast to coast to coast. And the ELCIC churches became members of the CCC beginning in 1952. Um, so we will have information on two relevant upcoming uh, events that will be put uh, in the chat box regarding the Lutheran Day of Learning, which is coming at you as well from November 5, and the Canadian Council of Churches Day of Learning on November 6. Um, so now that we've gotten through uh, a few announcements and our land acknowledgement, um, I'd invite you to join me in a prayer. Gracious God, open our minds our ears, our eyes, and our hearts, our whole bodies to receive your word so that we all and all your creation may experience the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Hannah. Uh, I'm going to look again to see if you can see me. Give me a wave if you can, if you can hear me. Terrific. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate that. Um, uh, Hannah is not only my child, but she is tech crew for uh, Peter and Karen Kuhnert. And for this, we are eternally grateful that we were blessed with children because on our own, we couldn't make it work. <laughs> so uh, our study today and in these next five sessions today and four more uh, is around Gordon Jensen's book, Experiencing Gospel. Let me see if you can see that. Very good. Okay. So I'm going to give you your first test to see how people are, um, are able to manage the technology uh, perhaps better than I. Uh, if you can find your reaction button on your Zoom platform, uh, give us a thumbs up in the reaction button if you have been able to locate Gordon's book for the Bible study. Okay. Okay. So for those, fantastic, are on the gallery view, if you are looking at the gallery view, you can see the number of people who have been able to find their reaction button. And I see at least one person has put up an X in their reaction. So they weren't able to find the, the book and uh, this book from Gordon. So Gordon's text is available from Augsburg Fortress or 1517 Publishing. 
Uh, Stephen Larson got me my copy through an overnight service, and I had it, I think, in about 24 hours. Uh, Gordon, Stephen is with us today. And so if you would still like to get the book, I know that they are available. If you get the Kindle edition, you can get it and use it online on your computer at a reduced price. And if you are doing this Bible study as a congregational Bible study, which I know some of you are, there is a discount if you order more than 10 copies at a time, which is what my congregation, St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Ontario, did. And I wonder if you would send up a reaction to Hannah, maybe a word of thanks for the participation of young Canadian Lutherans who are going to be with us in the, this five session Bible study. Terrific. Okay. We're learning here a little bit because in the sessions to come, uh, we would like them to be a bit more interactive. Uh, I also welcome you to begin your contributions to the chat box. The chat function, for those of you who know how to use your chat function, is a place where we can send you some documents and post citations. And also it's a place where you can send back to us the questions that you might have, if not for today's Bible study, then for the Bible studies that are to come in the weeks ahead we will cumul accumulate the questions uh, for our ongoing learning. And Gordon will be doing the fifth session, the final session uh, in Waterloo and on Zoom from Waterloo. And um, Gordon is looking forward to seeing all of the questions and uh, following up. Our session today focuses on chapter five. Uh, Luther's emphasis on word. So my task today is to sort of create a context for the entirety of the Bible study so that we can get uh, everybody into a common conversation and uh, more people into the Bible study. And by the end of it, I uh, intend to get to chapter five itself, which focuses on Luther's emphasis on word. Uh, can I get some sense from you of how many people have read chapter five already? So I know how much information I have to go back and cover. Okay, I'm going to look in the speaker view. Okay, very good. So there's quite a few people, fantastic. Fantastic. So experiencing gospel, when I spoke to Gordon this morning from Saskatoon, Gordon is not able to join us today because Gordon is hosting uh, Reverend David Tin in Saskatoon. David is from Toronto and uh, there is a delegation from Toronto and from Hong Kong uh, meeting at LTS this morning to look at continuing education and the incoming um, diversity of Canadians that are coming from Hong Kong and elsewhere. Uh, so Gordon wanted to be sure that part of what I was communicating with you was the particular emphasis on Gordon's choice to call this book Experiencing Gospel experiencing gospel being the uh, little known or lesser known or less emphasized uh, part of Luther's work that Gordon discovered when Gordon was on his sabbatical in Wittenberg. Uh, Gordon's discovery, which we will hear about over these next uh, five sessions, um, really happened as he was looking at a Bible and as he was looking, he noticed that some of the words were capitalized, all caps, or what's sometimes called majuscules. And these words that were all caps popped off the page. And Gordon turned to uh, the uh, workers who were with him on that tour and said, uh, what do you think's going on there? Is that a typo or... Uh, 
what's happening? And they said, well, gee, never noticed it before. Not quite sure what that is. So Gordon was on his sabbatical and said, well, I'm going to try and dig into that and figure out what's happening there. And it is from that that Gordon uh, discovered these seven words in four phrases that are capitalized in the 1534 version of the Bible that Martin Luther created with what Gordon sometimes refers to as a collective of Sanhedrin, those who sit around and study scripture and do exegesis, but also in Luther's work with a lot more creative individuals who helped to bring the 1534 Bible into being as the, the first complete uh, Bible of Protestantism from Wittenberg, certainly the first one that had a, a notion of an idea-to-idea -idea translation of scripture text rather than a text-to-text -text translation, but a, how, how do we get people to think about and receive the scripture message as good news for them. And this was a very different kind of Bible. And so Gordon has uh, wanted me to emphasize that because if you understand that notion of experiencing gospel as the most important part of the book, then these five sessions in Bible study um, all fit in with an, under the context of experiencing gospel. And so uh, it might be a little bit different than the kinds of Bible studies some of you might otherwise be thinking of. Gordon asked me to, um, to do a little exercise with you, and I'm, I'm going to do that exercise with you now and uh, see if this is another way for you to access what this text, what this Bible study series is really about. He says... Close your eyes and breathe. Breathe in the presence of God. Allow yourself to experience being inspirited, inspired by the breath of God. Breathe in and breathe out. You have been changed by the breath of God in you. Breathe in the presence of the word. Don't just hear it. Don't just read it. Breathe word into the fullness of your being. The breath of God is given to you as a gift right where you are. God's creative word never leaves you as it finds you. It changes you in the experience of your breath. Breathe in holy word. Can you feel it? This word gives life. I'm Reverend Karen Kuhnert, and I am uh, a member of the Remembering Today for the Church of Tomorrow project, along with Don Schoberg and Stephen Larson and Gordon Jensen. And uh, we are the first of the planners that joined this work of bringing this Bible study to you, a particular Bible study across Canada Bible study. So blessings to you from our home in the Eastern Synod. Uh, but also in today's Bible study, you will get a little bit of input from the Maritimes and a little bit of input, as we have already seen from Saskatoon this morning, 
Uh, greetings to those who are joining from the MNO Synod and from Saskatchewan Synod, from the BC Synod and from my homeland of the Synod of Alberta and the territories. Our Bible study today is meant to be active and engaged. If there's something you experienced in that exercise of breathing word, even as we're about to learn a little more about word, feel free to put that in the chat or feel free as I, as I sent you by email to grab your pen and paper and to make a note to yourself about that experience of breathing word, a different understanding of word than we often have in our Sunday mornings. Reverend Eric Parker from Manitoba is going to be giving us the fourth Bible study in the series. Gordon, as I said, will provide the fifth, fifth in the series. Along the way, Reverend Dr. Peter Kuhnert will also be one of the presenters. And we will hear from young Canadian Lutherans from across the country uh, we look forward next week to Boston Lafferty uh, coming to us from British Columbia. This is a cross-Canada Bible study to help bring us together as ELCIC Lutherans from coast to coast to coast. Hannah will be putting in the chat box for you the registration link for the Lutheran Day of Learning. I hope that link is a little bit easier than this Bible study link was. And if you have any difficulty registering again, please uh, let me know, send me an email in advance. Today, it's my job, as I said, to get us from the overview experiencing into the understanding of word. And I want you to make a note, if you don't mind, of what it is you thought you were entering into when you heard the phrase Bible study. Even between Hannah and I, we have a lot of different understandings of what makes a Bible study. Uh, we are an intergenerational family on the Zoom today. I see also my uh, mother-in-law is here. So Hannah's generation, my generation, uh, my mother-in-law, Mary Louise's generation, the phrase Bible study would mean something different and overlapping for each of us. Uh, in that um, in that reflection. So please take a moment to write down what you think constitutes a Bible study. And then if you could make a note to yourself what it is you thought word would be referring to before you entered into this time of Bible study. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to to make a note and feel free to put your note into the chat if that's what you would like to do. Terrific. Terrific. Excellent. So the next piece I'd like you to do is, uh, again, uh, getting into this sense of Gordon's uh, desire for us to, uh, to use scripture, to use Luther's uh, text 
in the Bible, uh, particularly for this passage in the Wisdom of Solomon, which is featured in chapter five of Gordon's book. Uh, but in chapters ahead, we're going to get to the scripture text that refers to the transfiguration. And uh, that is in the Synoptic Gospels. And after that, we're going to get into Romans, the scripture passage in Romans. Uh, for today, I want us to listen to uh, an understanding of word as it comes to us from music. As Lutherans, one of the uh, key places of lay theology for us is our hymnody, our, our hymn texts. And Hannah is going to play for us, I believe, or I will, uh, is going to play for us a um, hymn that comes to us from Tim McNabb, used with permission from Resurrection Halifax. The words are on the screen, and as your microphones are all muted, Feel free to sing along with Tim. Uh, I will not because then you will all hear me singing instead of Tim. Uh, but you feel free to sing along where you're at. at your word we have come again to hear you let our thoughts and hearts be stirred and in glowing faith be near you as the promises here given draws holy up to heaven all our knowledge, sense, and sight lie in deepest, darkest shrouded till your spirit breaks the night, filling us with light unclouded. All good thoughts and all good living come but by your gracious giving radiance of god's glory bright light of light from god proceeding jesus send your blessed light help our hearing speaking heeding that our prayers and songs may please you as with grateful hearts we praise you father son and holy ghost praise to you and adoration grant us what we need the most all your gospels consolation while we here on earth await you till in heaven with praise we greet you thank you tim thank you tim tim got so many of us through covid didn't he with playing his organ and providing the words the, the words to us. I'm going to share my screen with you now as we begin to get a little bit deeper into this nexus of where experiencing gospel. Remember, it's not just from Gordon Jensen. Gordon Jensen is pointing us to Luther's pointing us to experiencing gospel. Uh, and also uh, emphasis on the word. I noticed that this was something that a number of you mentioned in the chat box. There we go. So what I want to point out to you in this first slide, can you see my cursor moving around here? This image here is an image that comes to us from Sundays and Seasons 
which is where we get a lot of our symbols from in church and what we communicate on our websites and in our bulletins. Uh, Gordon is pointing us to Bible study that, yes, looks at Bibles, as you can see the word open here. And I sent this one to you by email. This particular Bible is Luther's personal Bible. Uh, it is not only the Bible that he and his colleagues created, but it is his personal Bible that he received a couple of years after all of the uh, other Bibles were sold. And it includes his own notations of the ways he would have changed their textual translations or changed the images or pieces of the Bible. I sent that to you by email. And uh, Kiersey Stierna says this in Praise for Experiencing Gospel. Dr. Gordon Jensen's discovery of Luther's decision to capitalize certain words in his Bible translation led to this delightful study that demonstrates both Luther's intentionality in communicating the gospel and his commitment to lead the reader to experience forgiveness. And it's for this uh, reason that I have highlighted for you here uh, the, the arm of Jesus here in the manger. Uh, do you see how in setting these two images next to you, we're, we're getting underneath Gordon's uh, concept of word in chapter five. Uh, Gordon is saying the scripture text as we receive it is like a manger and the manger bears through words, through ink on page, bears the living gospel, Jesus, who is the word. What is communicated to us then when we're reading the pages, as you see on your left, I believe it's your left, what we're experiencing is that outreaching arm of Jesus, as we see on the right. In this particular image that comes to us from the naming of Jesus, uh, you see that there is an elderly man on his knees and uh, the effort is to um, receive from the infant child that uh, gift of goodness and wisdom and forgiveness, particularly being the important uh, piece that Luther was dealing with at around 1517. And Peter will deal with that a little bit more when he's talking about indulgence uh, two weeks from now. So it demonstrates Luther's intentionality in communicating the gospel and the purpose is that the reader or the listener or the person who can't read but can look at the pictures can experience forgiveness. This is the understanding of word. Here's a different way of presenting the concept to you. Over here, you see, you see the outreaching arm of the child in the manger becomes the outreaching arms of Jesus on the cross. This is the cross of the uh, church in, uh, in Wittenberg where Luther preached um, many of his sermons, most of his sermons. And uh, if we got close in on this picture, as we will uh, in future studies, you would see that the blood of Christ is actually splattered across the community. And the entire focus of the predella is on Jesus at the very center. Luther is not pointing people to a Bible. Luther is certainly not pointing anyone to himself. Luther is pointing the entirety of the crowd to Jesus as though to say, this is the word communicating to you, telling you what forgiveness looks like. 
So on the one hand, we have the icon image of the infant Jesus reaching out as the word communicating forgiveness to the elderly man. And in the predella uh, on, the, on the art piece, Jesus reaching out from the cross and right beneath the cross. And this was the Thanksgiving altar uh, in that church in Wittenberg last year. I, my family was in Wittenberg uh, exactly a year ago today. Uh, the scripture text is open beneath Jesus on the cross. And there you are seeing uh, to the right and to the left, the communion bread and uh, grapes reminding us that uh, word and sacrament are held together in the Lutheran tradition. There's a little bit uh, closer up the, uh, the blood spatter. If you can see my cursor moving around on your screen, the entirety of the image is uh, splattered, blessed, if you will, with the blood of Jesus from across the uh, from the cross. So now we are getting into at three thirty six the actual scripture passage for chapter five that Gordon points us to in our text for today, a reading from the wisdom of Solomon. Hannah, would you mind? Uh, Coming back onto the screen and reading that for us. Um, instead of this punishment, you showed kindness to your people and you prepared quails to eat, a delicacy to satisfy the desire of appetite. For neither herb nor poultice cured them, but it was your word, O Lord, that heals all people. Thank you, Hannah. So the wisdom of Solomon is a, a text that people would be surprised uh, that Luther would uh, capitalize in all capitals. You can see there uh, in the yellow highlight, as I have highlighted the baby's arm in yellow as word, I have highlighted W-O-R-D in the chapter five image that you're given, it is W-O-R-T because it is Wort in the German vernacular language of Luther's time. But the concept here is that Jesus is the word that heals. On one hand, we see the gentleman bowing on his knees before Jesus in the manger, uh, receiving experience of gospel, receiving forgiveness, receiving breath of life, receiving the hope that comes with the word. And on the other side, you see the Bible text, the 1534 Bible edition, as the bearer of that word to us. Uh, I think many of you would think of the wisdom of Solomon as a strange place, also because it's the Apocrypha. Uh, Luther appreciated the canonical texts uh, more so, and certainly the New Testament uh, scriptures, but it was in wisdom chronologically in time, but also wisdom in the chronology of scripture texts, where he first wanted to highlight uh, what word meant. And he had this sense that word was connected because the word was a healing word. So I've given you here a different image of that outreaching hand as a word of grace to you, a word of grace to all who hear the word. So scripture in this sense bears the word uh, and when it bears it to you like the breath of God, it changes you, it finds you where you are, and it gives you life. Some of you might already be thinking ahead. Uh, you might be thinking about uh, how it is that we think of Bible passages, and particularly how we think of healing in our congregational life, laying on of hands being only one of the ways we uh, we share a touch that communicates God's love and forgiveness. In the book, it says, why was this passage uh, in the Apocrypha the first? And why, I asked Gordon this morning, 
why did you make it the first chapter of your book? And he said one of the main reasons for his for Luther's high regard of this book is the prominent theme of God's righteousness and grace toward the sinner. Wisdom like justification by grace through faith is something given by God alone. It cannot be earned. This is uh, this is Luther's link between uh, the overall word that the entirety of the Bible is communicating a word of forgiveness to those in need of a word of forgiveness. You and me, wherever we are across Canada, uh, you and me and all of our ancestors for the last 500 years, uh, but intentionally Martin Luther's own community in Wittenberg uh, because they were struggling with um, uh, insecurity around forgiveness. And this was a time of buying and selling indulgences as a way to deal with that anxiety that they could never, we could never uh, do enough to earn God's forgiveness. It always left us in a place of anxiety and stress. And the wisdom of Solomon harkens back to Genesis, where we understand that God creates all things as a gift, and that God gives it uh, as grace towards the sinner, because that's who God is. And here I want to draw one more, uh, one more parallel. Uh, you have already heard me referring to uh, the altar cross in Wittenberg. Uh, you see the art image again from the Cronach workshop. But the image of the bronze serpent in the first tallest icon, um, you can see that people are being encouraged to look to the serpent as the place for healing in that scripture passage. Then you see in the 1500s, Luther pointing to Jesus on the cross as the place to look for a word of healing. And I'm reminding you that in our worship services, uh, when we have a processional um, or the Bible is brought out into the middle of the community, even though we're looking at the Bible, we're looking at the scriptures, or even if we're looking at the cross, we're meant to be focusing our eyes to the word, to Jesus, the living word, and experience the gospel forgiveness for ourselves in the doing of that. We're not, uh, we're not, uh, we're not bowing to the physical Bible. You can see behind me here, I think that I'm a, I'm a person who takes Bibles pretty seriously. I have, uh, I have quite a collection behind me, but the Bibles are uh, bearers. Here's a hefty uh, German Bible in Luther's translation. But all of these Bibles, like a manger, bear the word who wants to come to us through the scriptures. Horrific. So I wonder if we might, for a moment, come out of this uh, screen sharing and come back into uh, into uh, an opportunity for uh, for checking in with each other. I'm going to end the screen share. So chapter chapter five, emphasis on the word. Uh, is there anybody? Uh, else that is has put something into the into the chat box we should be looking at. Thank you to all of those who have been acknowledging their traditional territory into the uh, into the chat box here. That's very much appreciated. Good to be together. Thank you for all of those who have joined. The cradle of the gospel. We do not worship the book manger, but the Christ child in the book manger. Thank you to 
Pastor Patricia Janalaya for that. Yes, this is very much the concept that we're getting to. So in, in, Mar in Gordon's book, Experiencing Gospel, for those of you who have already had the opportunity to see the book, uh, the book tells us about the care that went into transcribing, translating, uh, rethinking the images and the ideas of scripture, uh, and then into the physical production of a fairly significant and hefty Bible. It was a, a Bible that involved uh, considerably more people than had been the case before in its production because Luther's sense was that the people of his parish had also experienced a great deal of uh, need for forgiveness and answer to their need for forgiveness. And they were encouraged to pour that out in the ideas that they brought to him as pastor, as teacher, as uh, colleague in their experiences of everyday life. They knew what it was uh, before that had them in a more anxious state. Uh, and then they, they knew how it was that the new thinking around the good news was uh, giving them peace from this anxiety that they were experiencing um, in their time. The, they created a Bible that was intended for children. It was intended for people who were not yet uh, literate. It was intended to be uh, made in small pieces so that it was portable and it uh, traveled great distances, particularly along waterways. But it was also meant to be something that people gathered around and listened to and shared with one another. And people could um, sit and look at the physicality of the Bible and experience gospel from that, uh, from that um, material object that they created. I'm going to give you a moment here to see if anybody has any questions. Then Hannah, do I see any? No, nope, not yet. Anna, could I get you to read for me the the passage that uh, Gordon uh, highlighted for us for uh, today's Bible study? All right. So the message I have to share is from Gordon saying Luther wanted people to experience the Christ who speaks a word of forgiveness to pe the people in need. His translation thus offered an alternative to a system of forgiveness that relied on purchasing indulgences a system that made forgiveness a, co a comfort for those Christians in purgatory, a monetary transaction that decidedly favored those who could afford it. His alternative relied instead on an encounter with the one who is the word, the one to whom all people are called to listen. In that encounter with the living word, the gospel is experienced as forgiveness is proclaimed and tasted. This is what made Luther's Bible translation project worthwhile. Terrific. So is there anybody who has some sort of a wondering or some kind of a reaction to this sense of what experiencing gospel uh, meant in the context of Luther's uh, highlighting some words in the Bible that had never been highlighted before. Gordon uses the analogy of uh, as though using a yellow marker in the Bible. And for those of you who are uh, preachers, um, he very clearly pointed out that he was doing this so that when preachers or proclaimers of the good news were going through the Bible, those all caps words which were rare, would jump out so that you wouldn't miss the gospel on the page. You could easily find it and you could easily preach from it and know the context of it. Hannah, in the gallery view, are there any hands up with comments or questions? We just had a message come in. 
uh, was it not the intention of Luther that the word also be spoken word? The word was heard. Yes, excellent. The word, uh, so this was a, uh, this was a different, this was a different moment. The word was to be heard and it was to be heard so that it could be heard as good news for the hearer. That's a very good point. Uh, but the intention is not to, based on Gordon's book, uh, not to focus us on hearing the reader or the pastor, but if you will, from the slides before, thinking of the reader or the pastor in the role of Luther in the pulpit in that art piece I showed you with that reader or the preacher pointing to Christ, the living word, the living gospel right there uh, from whose mouth the word of forgiveness is coming to you. So the, the, the breath of God, the inspiration, inspiritedness, the word that comes into you as an audible word that you can hear in your ear, but it doesn't register. This is in the, in the text, Gordon's text. It doesn't register in your ear. It goes past your ear and straight to your heart. And when it comes into your heart, then it changes you. So the gospel through the proclaimer saying the word has pointed you to the gospel telling you through your ear to your heart that you are so loved and forgiven that the grace you have been gifted with can now overflow from you and out to neighbors and community. So uh, some people have, have um, been inclined to think of baptism as the water makes you a Christian. And um, there is the... Uh, the other understanding that it is not the water, but it is the word that clings to the earthly element, the water that touches you and the word communicates to you through your ear, through your body, through your head, wherever the water has hit you. And that word of forgiveness, grace, gospel uh, lands in your heart and changes you and through you then changes the world. This is an experiencing gospel understanding of what happens when you are touched by the word. Our next, our next Bible study next Tuesday at three o'clock Eastern Standard Time will not be quite so esoteric because chapter six is about the story of the transfiguration. Uh, as I mentioned, um, it is in the synoptic gospels. I believe in experiencing gospel, uh, Gordon provides the visual of what it looks like from the gospel of St. Matthew. And a reminder for those of us who think of transfiguration as a Sunday after Christmas, a Sunday in January, it's the last Sunday of Epiphany, that if you were to do a little bit of research, uh, most Christian traditions don't commemorate transfiguration. This is something that Luther thought was so important that he put, put it back on the Christian calendar. And it is because uh, in the studying of the text, uh, comes the word of God, listen to him. And God is saying, Jesus is my beloved. This is my beloved. Listen to him. And what we are to be listening to is Jesus, the word, that infant child in the manger, that uh, dying and resurrecting Jesus on the cross, who is coming to each one of us wherever it is that we are and communicating a word of uh, love and forgiveness and release 
from tyrants and uh, anxiety and the stresses of this world so that the love of God would uh, flow to us, through us, and out into the world that God so loved, God sent God's only son. So I welcome your emails over the course of the next week. And if there's anything that we can do to help you uh, navigate your Zoom functions, uh, please let us know because we're only happy, too happy to do that as we get closer to Gordon's time with us on November 5 and the Lutheran Day of Learning. Have a closing prayer. This is a slightly adapted prayer um, from the ELW um, entitled Race to Receive the Word. So, blessed Lord God, you have caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast to the hope of eternal life, which you have given us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Thanks so much, everybody. See you next week. Amen. Blessings. <laughs>